Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War Two TV. It doesn't seem that long since I was with you before because it was not that long I was with you before with James Holland. But anyway, joining me today is distinguished Canadian author and historian Mark Zilke, who has covered pretty much all of Canada's land battles, and today is talking about the Canadian Battle for Sicily. And as James Holland said, it's a battle, a campaign that kind of gets overlooked but has all the elements you need in it. It has leadership, it has terrain challenges, it has um, a, a decent enemy at times. And uh, to talk, take us through it is Mark. So good afternoon, Mark. How are you today? I'm well and good to see you, Paul. Good to see you. And we should remind people, this is kind of essentially part one of a double bill. You're with Brad on, on this day in Canadian military history on Wednesday to kind of go into a deeper right. dive in, in some of the campaign, but you're giving us a bit of an overview today. So um, you heard me on the top of the, the top of the show there about that it's a bit overlooked. Do, do you feel the Sicily campaign on the 80th anniversary is finally getting a bit of attention from people? Uh, it is. Um, and here in Canada, we have the advantage that um, Steve Gregory, who launched Operation Husky 2013 10 years ago, which I was very much involved in, has returned to Sicily for Operation Husky 2023 and is currently carrying out a march across Sicily in my God, the heat. Yeah, <laughs> um, right now. yeah so I, I don't know how they're faring. I imagine it's a, it was hard when we did it in 2013. The temperatures are way higher this, this time around. So, um, but anyway, they're marching across, following the route of the Canadians uh, from the beach and ultimately ending up at Jura Canadian War Cemetery uh, for ceremonies at, um, uh, will happen on July 30th, I believe. Um, so that is, coming out of that is a fair amount of media attention, which is uh, heartening to see because we didn't have that in 2013. It was impossible to get the CBC and, and CTV and the other big tech networks to actually follow what was going on there, but they are on top of it here. So it does raise the um, understanding and knowledge of that campaign within Canada. You know, mm. I still think Operation Husky and ultimately the entire Italian campaign does live in the shadows of uh, Normandy. And well, the, I think uh, it always Northern will. Campaign. I mean, no matter how much we talk about it, I think it always will be dominated by Normandy. But, you know, all we can yeah. do is keep on sharing the stories and, and tackling it and hoping that people kind of branch out from their interests. But what we'll do is I'll bring mm. up the PowerPoint. I'll kind of follow your lead and um, we're going to talk sure. about the Canadian campaign. And as James uh, Holland mm. said earlier, your involvement was massive. That was the word he yeah. said. So, uh, yeah, and it's an interesting thing. It was massive. And at the same time, it was initially unexpected. Um, the Canadians were not booked to go to the invasion of Sicily. They were um, in, in the UK in strength, uh, 1st Canadian Army. And the idea was is that 1st Canadian Army was to be kept whole so that it could go into the invasion of cross-channel invasion when and wherever that happened. Um, and that was pretty strict rule. Uh, but as 1943 developed, um, what we started to see back home in Canada and what we were seeing amongst some of the leadership in the Canadian Army was a feeling that the Canadians, the Canadian Navy was heavily involved in the Battle of the Atlantic, the Canadian Air Force was heavily involved in bomber command operations over Germany and France. And the Canadian Army was sitting in England having a nice time. And there was really starting to be pressure that Canadians had to fight. And where they fought really didn't matter. <laughs> it's just that they were wanting to get them into the fight. Mm -hmm. um, and so Harry Krirar, who of course was always behind getting Canadians into the fight in Dieppe and Hong Kong and other places, um, starts working politically behind the doors with uh, the Canadian government and also with the, um, combi the uh, high command in the British Army. And out of that comes an invitation for Canadians to send one division and one tank brigade. And that's how we ended up in Operation Husky. And so that was sort of decided in um, late April of 1943. And so there was quite a scramble to get themselves, for us to get organized, uh, to go 
to um, to Sicily. So that was kind of the winding path that brought us to this. Yeah, and, and, and James mentioned the nine iterations of the of the Husky plan, and that, you know, do do you happen to remember which? which iteration the Canadian involvement becomes part of it? They really come in at the kind of like the eighth iteration. So really by that time, the, the plan is pretty much finalized. Um, you know, there was the initially, of course, there was even the whole discussion about was where, where we're going to invade Sicily or was it going to be Corsica or was it going to be Sardinia or was it going to be Greece? Um, you know, all that back and forth thing. Um, so by this time, when the Canadians get involved, it's definitely going to be Sicily. Uh, and then pretty rapidly, uh, the final iteration comes out and um, it's going to be the Canadians landing on the left flank of the British Eighth Army so that we're up against the right flank of the American Army. <clears throat> in a, So basically in a supporting role, that's the uh, vision for the invasion. And so then we have the uh, sea voyage to um, Sicily, which is um, interesting because there were three there's three ships that are carrying freighters that are carrying the main bulk of first Canadian divisions vehicles. And by total coincidence, the three ships in the Canadian convoy that get sunk by German U boats are those three ships. Mm -hmm. um, and so the Canadians now have this incredible handicap that we've lost about 70% of our, of our transport, transport, trucks, Bren carriers, all the things you need to be, mobile, to be a mechanized army are pretty much gone. And so ultimately this leads to the Canadian soldiers for much of the uh, Sicily campaign, the infantry is left marching. Um, and that's the genesis of the whole Operation Husky 2013, Operation Husky 2023 thing. It's, it's the one battle uh, campaign that you can actually walk in the footsteps that they walked. Because uh, every other place, you know, it was mechanized warfare. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so the landings are, there was an expectation that the landings were going to be heavily, heavily resisted. Um, and so, you know, literally the plan, there was thinking that, you know, this whole thing could end very badly. The Canadians could end up being, you know, killed in the, in the, in the water. <laughs> but what we hadn't counted on was it was defended by Italian coastal defense troops. And they really didn't have much interest in fighting. Uh, so when the Canadians come ashore, uh, they pretty much just pack it in. Um, I remember loyal, loyal Edmonton Regiment, uh, Leo uh, Stenko, I think was his last name. Uh, when he walked, landed on the beach, he's, there's two, two Italian soldiers. One's about 75 years old and the other looks to be about 15. And uh, no, Sam Lenko, sorry, is his name. And Sam is got his rifle and the guys behind him are saying, shoot them, Sam, shoot them. And Sam looks over and says, we're just an old man and a kid. And he just yells at them, vi, vi, which means go away. Um, and they do, they just drop their guns and run. And uh, then he comes, comes to shore. So it was pretty straightforward. There was very light casualties <laughs> and they landed. And the destination for that day, you'll see up in the far, in the corner, the right-hand corner, uh, a town called Pequino and an airfield. And the airfield was the, the objective that day. And it fell with just a very small fight uh, to the Royal Canadian Regiment. And that gave the Allies their first airfield on in Sicily. Now, you know, it's going to take them some days to, to develop it into a functioning airfield because there's still a battle line uh, on July 10th of 1943. You can see the, where the day ends in those dotted lines up at the top. Um, but anyway, we're ashore. And the campaign initially in the first few days is really a lot of, a lot of marching. 
um, with the Italians uh, often coming forward to surrender by the hundreds. Um, there was a Lieutenant Sherry Atkinson of the uh, Royal Canadian Regiment. <coughs> and he um, was approaching a town called Modica. And uh, out of the, the uh, mayor of the town comes forward in all of his grandeur, of the epaulets and uniform and everything like that, and says, we want to, there's a garrison that wants to surrender. So Sherry rode in on his motorcycle with um, his Batman on the back. And they arrived, and there were about 800 uh, Italian soldiers all lined up with their guns stacked and everything, who surrendered to two Canadians. And, and so that's kind of the typical story of that particular period. Um, it's a pretty easy landscape when you're down on the uh, plain. Um, it's like this picture. It's orchards, uh, vineyards, olive groves, and a lot of dusty dirt. Um, in July, it was it's always a kind of drought conditions, so most of the streams are dried up. Uh, the Canadians, one of the things they, they suffered from was, of course, their transition from the United Kingdom to Italy happened very quickly. So they were totally not acclimatized mm. and ready and prepared for this kind of heat. And yet they were having to march. Uh, the temperatures routinely at that time of year, the temperatures hit around 38 to 42 degrees Celsius in the daytime. And so that's really what they were kind of marching in was those kind of temperatures. Um, they described their helmets as becoming like uh, frying pans that they were sitting on their heads. Um, very difficult. Uh, they were consuming a lot of water, more water than they, was being brought forward by the quartermasters. And so, of course, they were drinking out of ditches and other things, um, eating fruit that they weren't supposed to be eating because um, it hadn't been treated. And you start seeing a lot of cases of dysentery um, breaking out within the troops as well. Um, and malaria. So you say they're not very well acclimatized, but in terms of their preparation for the terrain, because as you know, the, the approach, the, the route of the Canadian army is pretty linear, but the terrain does change as you go along. Now, you know, you, they, they joined the plan fairly late. You said that yourself. So, you know, just how much knowledge did you know in your average platoon commander have for example about what the terrain was like inland from the beaches what it was going to be like further on is it kind of a, a question of kind of working out as they go along or is the, are they well prepared no it's really a question of working it out as they go along um they're the maps they have and this is always true of the entire italian campaign the maps are poor um, they're generally based on Italian army maps that the British army had possession of. And there was a lot of inaccuracy in those maps. So there's a lot of detail that's missing. And they're getting detail constantly fed to divisional headquarters by, you know, photo recce and, and other um, stuff that's coming in. So the, the picture's evolving, but it's pretty much make it up each day as you go. Um, you may be working uh, two days ahead of yourself um, at the divisional command level. <laughs> the Canadians were lucky. They had a, um, a quite competent divisional commander in, in uh, Major General uh, Guy Simmons, uh, who will ultimately become the uh, commander of 2nd Canadian Corps and the 2nd in command of 1st Canadian Army. Um, so they've got a good general uh, one who understands tactics and uh, has a good tactical mind and a good strategic mind. Um, so the leadership is pretty good um, at the brigade level as well. Um, oh, I was going to bring it up because, you know, in reading, rereading your book, you know, a lot of people, when they focus on Sicily, it's always Monty and Patton racing <laughs> from Messina. But actually, to me and, and your work, it's more that kind of brigade level, uh, battalion level. That's where... Not, not that a divisional commander doesn't have input because of the terrain, because of the villages, because of little passes. It seems to me that that mid-level of command, you get that right and things will work for you. Get mm. that wrong and, it, and it'll be a struggle. 
Yes, and that's very much the way the um, the Canadians, you know, in their training, really trained very much that the divisional commander is in the in the back seat. He's providing direction, but he's not leading from the front. Um, the brigadiers are supposed to also be somewhat in the back seat, um, letting their battalion commanders, uh, giving their battalion commander a direction, but not telling them, well, this is what you got to do. You got to send company A this way and yeah, company B yeah. that way. You know, it's it's left to that that battalion commander to actualize the um, the operation. And so they had some pretty good guys. I, I love this photo of Major Strom Galloway. Um, Strom's a good example of um, some of the, um, the actual um, strength that the uh, Canadians had uh, through the CAN loan program and also through a couple of other programs, uh, various Canadian officers down to and down to the uh, rank of sergeant uh, were sent to North Africa and they fought in British units. And so they got experience. Um, Strom served with the Irish regiment in North, North Africa. And so, you know, They've not been in battle together before, but there's been a number of the Canadians who have seen combat and and know how to what to expect. So we're still a pretty unblooded, if you will, division of Canadians. But there's there's a little core strength there that that we're able to work with. Uh, and that's I mean important because one of the things we've been discussing during this series is that, is that. <coughs> Husky is part of a series of stepping stones from from torch through to the, you know the, the land the fighting in Italy later and indeed Normandy and and as you said you know though the Canadian division had not fought there before there were these key personnel and and Richard O'Sullivan who just been off the back of organizing the events in Sicily you know um, Galloway a legend with the Irish Brigade out in Tunisia so you know you, you sometimes you don't need to have many figures within an organization who've had that experience if they have enough influence and it seems to me that these people have got enough influence to kind of take what they've learned and and share it around is that fair to say yes very much so and um strom uh who i i knew for years um he um he was a very forceful and uh strong leader uh who should have eventually had the Royal Canadian Regiment command, but because he wasn't permanent force, he came out of the re reserves. Uh, that was never going to happen because permanent force in those days, it was going to be permanent force officers who commanded the regiments. So he often referred to himself as the general who never was. <laughs> but he, um, he, within the Royal Canadian Regiment, he was a he was a very strong figure. Like he dominated how that regiment operated uh, really throughout the, the course of the war. He was often the second in command <laughs> and he was very um, influential, influential. He was very well loved by the, um, the rank and file of that regiment. So, and that's the other thing is though, like the leaders, um, you see a lot of the Canadian commanders uh, being quite close to their the, their soldiers. Um, partly that's a result of the reserve system that existed in Canada, because, um, you know, for example, there's a couple different ones where I can think of regiments that one of the commanders was the high school um, principal. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and so all of his kids are the soldiers <laughs> and and he takes them off to war you know because canada was still a very small country and and mm. we had very and these villages and towns you know everyone knew everybody and so you had this real strong identity of of who the seaforth highlanders were for example you know they were a regiment out of vancouver uh they all grew up Vancouver wasn't the huge city it is now. You know, they grew up together. The um, Smokey Smith was, uh, who became a, vet, a Victoria Cross winner. Um, the soldier who was wounded alongside him, who he uh, fought beside uh, to earn the Victoria Cross because he was protecting that guy. You know, they grew up together on the same street. Um, so that was the kind of stories that you, you see. It's a very cohesive 
um, battalion system. Brilliant, thank you. So we're off the beaches, and there, there's that map, there, <laughs> general map showing that kind of nice linear route there, which, as you said, is easy to kind of well, not easy. Uh, those they're they're walking it right now, and probably would describe it as easy, but at least it's one direction. So take us through the the, mm. the, the, the days and weeks that followed the actual landing. Yeah. So if you look at that map, um, the easy time is as they're marching up in those two lines that are se separated from each other. And then the two lines come together at a place called Grandma Kelly on July uh, 16th, I believe. And Grandma Kelly, everything starts to change because suddenly they come into the, the town of Grandma Kelly and they're facing German troops. Up until this time, they've been fighting Italians and it's really been... Well, they often described it in the way that they always do in the war diaries as a walk in the park. <laughs> and it basically had been a very hot walk in the park. But they get to Grandma Kelly and they face their first real uh, shoot up with, with the um, Germans. And the Germans at this point, they're not trying to stop the Canadian advance. They're just wanting to blunt it and, and hurt them hurt the Canadians. Actually, they don't even know they're fighting Canadians at this point. They think we're Brits. It's a couple days later that they realize that it's the Canadians. <laughs> because their intelligence told them that the Canadians were in the UK. <laughs> you know, so um, there we are. Suddenly it changes. And so that's where the fighting really starts to take off. And you start again, it's, it's kind of block and hold, block and hold actions that the Germans are putting on right up until they get up to Piazza Armarina, which is July 17th, up in that left-hand corner when we finally get, you know, crowding up to the edge of that map. And then the Germans get more serious. Um, and this is Russell Crowe and... Um, uh, his name escapes me right now. He ends up being killed. Uh, Billy Pope. Billy Pope. Billy Pope and um, and the Russell Crowe. Um, not Russell Crowe. That's the actor. The other Crowe. <laughs> um, and th this picture was taken on the outskirts of Piazza or Marina. So they move on to uh, Ralph Crow is the guy I'm talking about, uh, right. the lieutenant colonel commanding the RCR. And they move up to a town north of Piazza or Marina called Valgonera. And it's there that the fighting gets really intense. And um, they have a lot of am the uh, ambushes uh, are happening. Um, it, it's actually a really weird battle at Valgonera because both sides are ambushing each other. Um, so the Canadians will ambush one big group of Germans and then they'll move over. There's another bunch of Canadians moving over here and they run into an ambush that the Germans are setting. And it's a pretty wild uh, firefight that goes on there. <laughs> The Hasty Peas, um, who's got amongst them a, a, a major um, captain named Farley Mowat, who will become one of Canada's best-known authors after mm -hmm. the war, uh, was involved in an ambush just outside of Valgrenera, where he um, and his company, uh, they uh, managed to ambush a column of um, German convoy that was trying to get out of Valgrenera. And uh, they ran right into the Canadians and uh, were basically slaughtered by uh, brand gun fire from, from the Canadians. And um, this is the beginning of what would be a development of post-stress trauma disorder, PTSD, uh, for Farley Mowat, because he uh, witnesses uh two german drivers uh basically choking to death on their blood uh in the in the truck um and that haunts him uh for the rest of his life he writes about it in two different books um so you can see the impact of it and so the battle is getting really intense the royal canadian regiment at this point uh is also fighting into Valgrenera, <laughs> and that's where um um, Major Billy Pope, 
who was one of the ones in that photo, uh, he is killed um, trying to single-handedly attack a German tank with a Piet gun. And brings a point that although we had a pretty good leadership, um, we were Canadians were still learning and they were making some pretty big mistakes, like ones that cost them their lives. Um, Billy Pope, you know, basically was charging a German tank with a Piet gun um, all by himself. You know, this this is not something a major should do. <laughs> you, know? Really, no. <laughs> you know, and so it wasn't surprising that he ends up being killed. And Strom Galloway always lamented that death. He, he said it was so unnecessary and and yet at the same time, so typical of, of Billy Pope because he was rash and, and um, you know, devil may care uh, kind of approach to battle. Um, but, you know, here it's probably his third, fourth day of real combat and he makes a, you know, a mistake really that costs yeah. him his life. And and we see that with the Canadians. It's, um, it's as Strom put it, you know, we were still learning throughout Operation Husky and that, you know, some of those lessons you learn are learned the hard way. Yeah, no, thank you very much. So we look at that map there, which we had up earlier, but you know, we're seeing that, 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 that route that goes through towns. Is that, are the Canadians aiming for towns or are they aiming to eliminate Germans? What, what's the, what's the rationale behind that? You know, are they, have they got a series of towns and cross points, crossroads into a take, or are they, are their orders more just destroy the Germans, wherever they have, or and Italians earlier, wherever they happen to be? It's pretty much that. And, but the, uh, the towns provide defensive points at right. this point for the Germans. Um, they're, the t typical of these towns up here in the interior is that they're hilltop towns, so they're on high heights of ground, and they're the logical place to defend at this point until we get up to where um, Leon Forte and Monte Acero are, which is the one we'll be doing the deep dive with uh, Brad on Wednesday. Um, and so the towns are important there and up until the point of Valconera and just past that the canadian role in this operation has been to hold and protect the british eighth army flank and to maintain touch with the americans on their on the uh, right hand or the left hand side of them and that's what they've been doing but by the time they get up to Valconera, British Eighth Army has become deadlocked in front of Catania. Yeah, they can't get through Catania; uh, they're stuck. And Montgomery then orders Simmons to. The Canadians are now going to take over the advance, and their job is to now push really hard against the Germans. And with the idea that they will batter the Germans hard enough that the Germans will be forced to shift reinforcements over to face the Canadians and that that will weaken the German line in front of the rest of Eighth Army and Monty can achieve his breakout and advance up to Messina, which of course is the ultimate goal of the whole campaign is to get to the Messina Straits and and in hopefully in while doing that uh, trap the Germans in Sicily and destroy them. Um, doesn't work out that way, but <laughs> that, that's the intention. And uh, this is a great photo. It's it's Monty addressing the a group of Canadians and he did a little tour <clears throat> on the fifth day of, of the Canadian um, the landings so july 15th july 16th he did a tour uh where he went to all of the individual battalions of the canadians and gave them basically a pep talk um congratulating them on what they had achieved so far they hadn't yet come into contact with the germans he gives them a little bit you know you're about to come up against some very tough guys these are the germans uh the battle's going to change and you know, you've got to be ready for it. And um, 
So that it was a bit of a sobering warning of what was coming. And of course, it was also Monty's classic way of, of endearing himself to everyone who fought underneath him. Um, and it works. It works. Uh, you know, a lot of Canadians... people haven't seen through the Monty. <laughs> You know, when he's in front of tankers, he tells them how tanks are his winning weapon. When he's in front of gunners, he tells them how it's artillery. When he's with Canadians, they're the best. When he's in Kiwis, they're the best. I mean, that's that's, yeah. I mean, that's good man management. It's all Monty's faults, and there are there are plenty, I think, yeah. as, as a human being. He is very good at, at making the crowd in front of him uh, feel that he, 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 he loves them the most. Yeah, he really motivated them. Uh, and that came at an important time as well because they, you know, they had been marching in that heat. They were tired. They were worn down. They were thinking, God, can we actually do this? Um, and Monty comes along and says, yes, you can. <laughs> you know? um, so it, it works well. Uh, and that's what we see is that, that advance coming. So then now we're picking up the tempo. Um, we're pushing harder uh, because that has to happen. So we're trying to draw the Germans into battle. Uh, and the Germans are quite happy to facilitate us as well because the landscape is getting more rugged. And this picture is a good example of it. Um, basically, we're advancing into the mountains that are the foothills of Mount Etna. And they get pretty rugged and steep and the heat keeps going up. Uh, as you go further inland, it gets hotter and hotter. Um, and you've got the problem also developing that um, <coughs> Patton's now changed the plan on his own and has taken the, the main strength of the American forces and set off on a drive to Palermo. So that weakens the American strength on the Canadian left front kind of opens up more opportunity for the Germans to shift forces to get in front of us. And we're seeing that happen with Valganera. And then it really comes into play when the battles for Monte Acero and uh, Leon Forte begin. And that's because those two features are both, you know, Leon Forte is a hilltop town, Monte Acero is a hill, a large, very high hilltop with an old Norman castle on top. And it's linked, they're, they're linked by a ridge that runs between them. And the Germans fortify that entire uh, position and are waiting for us to come in. And their intent now is to stop a, the Canadians cold right there. And so there's um, the advance there is uh, you're seeing Leon Forte. It was up on the, um, just below the uh, scale. Yep, You'll yep. see Leon Forte and Acero. And that's the, um, the attack into there. And so the battle takes uh, pretty interesting turns here. Um, the Seaforth Highlanders were originally supposed to take Leon Forte, but um, they their headquarters unit gets struck by a uh, friendly fire artillery barrage, uh, and are basically um, although their casualties are quite low, they're they're slammed about enough that uh, there's no way the Seaforths can organize themselves to um, make that attack. So the Loyal Edmonton Regiment makes the attack into Leon Forte, and there they get hung up in a, in a very nasty street battle uh, that's a precursor to what they're going to face when they get to Ortona. But meanwhile, over on the right-hand side, Monte Acero is um, a real linchpin. If you take Mo the uh, Monte Acero, the Germans can't hold that ridge, and they ultimately can't hold Leon Forte. <laughs> but there's a road. The only route that seems logical up to Monte Acero is a switchback road that goes up the um, west side of the mountain. And initially, that's what they're thinking of advancing on. But studying it from... Um, Ditano Station, where they set up an observation point, um, they start to realize that there's no way you can go up that road and not be completely overlooked by German fire. So it's gonna—they're gonna get slaughtered if they do it. 
So then they start thinking, well, what can they do? And what they realize is if they go far out to the right, cross country at night, and get to Monte Acero's east flank, they can climb it, um, basically scale it at night, and hopefully take the Germans by surprise from that flank. And that's the operation that the Hasty Peas put in. Um, Farley Mowat's one of the uh, commanders of that, officers with that attack in, in the lead. Um, it's an incredible piece of landscape. Uh, the Monte Acero, the mountain itself at that time was carved out in these steps with vineyards running along each step. And I think there's like 28 of those steps and they have to climb each one and each one's about eight feet above the other so you know basically one guy climbs up he reaches down takes the gear and then helps the other guys up and that's how they made their way up monte acero um and they managed to do it without ever dropping any equipment without anything jingling and jangling without making any sounds talking to each other or anything like that and they got to the top and they come over the, the top um, and they do catch the Germans entirely by surprise. There's just two, guard, two guards on that side that they overwhelm really quickly. And they take the top of Monte Acero um, and then they hold it for two days. And that climb, um, Farley Moad always described it classically as each, each man in the Hasty Peas performed his own private miracle that night. Wow. Um, what a quote. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, it, sorry, no, at this point ahead. of the battle, you, know, you said earlier on, right at the beginning, about the loss of the ships on the <laughs> way there, and and the fact that now the Americans are kind of moving off the left. The British, yeah. are, are the Canadians, the commanders, fully aware of how much uh, extra burden is on their shoulders now compared to this kind of protecting of the flank job they've been doing earlier on? And you know, I mean, I mean, at the lower level, obviously the commanders. Mm -hmm. know, but your average, your average private in in one of these regiments, are they aware that the situation is changing? Yeah, they're they are they're they're aware that you know the um, there's a real push for speed. Suddenly, you know, before it was sort of like, okay, we go at the pace we have to go uh, or can go. Now it's like. You, we've got to go faster because, um, you know, you got to put, keep the pressure on the Germans. Can't give them a second to recover. And so the tempo has changed quite dramatically. And we're seeing it in losses, too. You know, the actual casualty rate is going up. Um, these the, the battle at Leonforte is quite costly for the Loyal Edmonton Regiment in the street fighting that they engage in. Monte Acero, uh, surprisingly, they got managed to do that and and not have a huge amount of casualties. That photo is actually, that's the Seaforth Highlanders uh, command headquarters, um, two of the guys that were wounded there. The, the one who's got his hands over his head is uh, a guy called Don Smith, who becomes a Canadian war artist um, later in the war. And becomes one of the most Canadian, famous Canadian abstract painters of, the, of that mm. era. Um, so, and you can sort of see, like, this is, you know, the medics are like that one guy standing, you know, he's he's running towards um, the scene because, you know, they, they got hit pretty hard. Um, mm. And there's a few comments on the sidebar about the fact that some of the ground around there isn't entirely suitable for tanks and et cetera, et cetera. Mm. At this point of the battle, what, what is working well for the Canadians? I mean, an artillery obviously is, is a very Canadian thing. David Patterson is going to talk about Canadian artillery a couple of weeks ago on the channel. And, you know, is, is that a, a, a winning asset that you would, you would dis describe as being important? Yes, the artillery is very important. More important than the tanks. We actually knew from the outset that, um, we weren't going to be able to use tanks the way we would normally have wanted to. So they've only assigned one battalion of tanks to the Canadian division. The other two battalions in the Canadian brigade um, are held in, in reserve and ultimately serve with the, um, with the um, British uh, in the, in the final days of the battle. Um, so we just have the three rivers regiment of tanks um, with the Canadians. And it's because, they're not able to really 
occasionally we can have them right up with the infantry and they can march into battle side by side like training tells you you should be able to do but often they're not able to and because they'd be just too exposed to the german german fighting um anti-tank guns fortunately germans don't have um Panzer Fausts at this time are Panzer Shreks. They they just have anti-tank guns. So the tanks are safer than they will become later in 1944. Um, but it's ultimately really artillery is the big the big uh, support. And and we've got all of our artillery regiments um, in, in the division there. And they're pretty much firing all the time. And they move fast to keep, keep up uh, right close up with hmm. the Canadian infantry as, as, to make sure that they, they're in range. And so the artillery can, can be a real strength, but it also gives a bit of a false sense of security to particularly uh, Major General Guy Simmons, who himself is a gunner. Uh, and he um, figures that he can shoot once Leon Forte and Monte Acero are taken he thinks he can shoot the uh, Canadians through to um, the town of Ajira and with a huge artillery barrage. <laughs> that's actually the heaviest artillery barrage fired in the uh, Sicilian campaign to this point because a lot of it, uh, British guns were also d d dedicated to it. And it's a classic, one of those barrages, you know, creeping barrage lifting every 50 yards um, and the Canadians are supposed to keep up to it. To it. Um, the infantry battalion commanders look at this plan and they say, it's not going to work <laughs> because there's vineyards and there's ditches and there's grape, you know, olive trees. And we're going to have to make our way through that. And this whole orderly World War I style advance is going to go in every which direction. And that's what happens. And it seems to me with this this high ground the Germans have and the and the the, the commanding views is that the only way the Canadians going to advance is is keep that pressure on pretty much constantly. Because there's a couple of comments about the fact that that twenty five pounder is not dug in there, so that it's not. I'm assuming they're moving with with the you know fast mm -hmm. behind the infantry, which is mm -hmm. is good to keep the pressure on the enemy, but it also means you're 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 stretching your own resources and you're exposed. Yes, and that's right. And um, you never see a picture of artillery in the Sicily campaign that's Canadian where the guns are dug in. You know, they're always right out in the open. Uh, and it's because they're moving. You know, the moment, they, the moment the Canadian the infantry moves out of range, they hook up and they, and they start towing them along because they do have their transport. You know, they have all yeah. the, the brand carriers and everything that they... But artillery, the ammunition does become an issue um, because they're burning through it pretty fast. And at this point, all the artillery ammunition is coming from North Africa, uh, being unloaded on the beach, that it's got to be driven to an ever advancing front. Um, same problem that we'll see in Normandy uh, mm -hmm. in 1944. Um, so, you know, you look at that stack of our ammunition there. Um, you can burn through that pretty fast. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, and, and our history explorer, who's our artillery expert, who was on the channel recently. I mean, you know, very professional gun crew there. You know, the ammunition is ordered. It's it's it's. There's no sense of kind of randomness there. But an artillery battery like that, it's it's always dependent on what the forward observers are doing as well. Because with an ever changing battle, with you pushing the enemy back like you are without updated information coming through, it doesn't matter how many shells you've got, if they're not hitting the target, it's all its all been for nothing. Yeah. And the forward observation officers, it's interesting, were very good. Um, and I think they had been, they'd spent so much time training in England and working with the guns that even though the landscape's entirely different, the... Um, heat the situation they're often operating at night um because that's the other thing the canadians do a lot is night attacks um night movements so that that because that destabilizes the germans um they learned very quickly that the germans didn't particularly like fighting at night they uh tended to try and avoid it and so the canadians well take it to them 
you know, mm. <laughs> uh, this is this is when we can hit them and hit them hard. And so the uh, forward observation officers have to be able to figure out the German positions, identify them on the maps properly, and get that that artillery on target. And uh, they seem to be pretty good at it. You know, it's um, it's um, very impressive, actually. So we talked about artillery, and then there's a classic photo you you included there, which you know. It's all about the infantry, though, isn't it? And Sicily is an infantryman's battle in many ways. I mean, James Bond, mm -hmm. of course, talks about the Navy, the, the combined arms, the Air Force. But, you know, when you're there, I've been to Sicily. When you're there in that terrain, it's the infantryman's battle. So tell us a little bit about how quickly, if they did, the Canadians who, had, as you say, they hadn't been acclimatized very well, they've been England. How, within the, you know, the couple of weeks of the, of the Husky campaign, how quickly do they adapt? How, what's the learning curve like? They adapt very quickly. Um, an interesting point is by the time they get into Valcarnera and that and are starting to fight in the mountains, um, the um, Germans um, report to uh, Albert Kesslering. They uh, actually say, we've come up against, we're up against a, a, a trained mountain division. Uh, and they start calling the Canadians the mountain boys. And the Canadians love this because the only mountain training they'd ever ha had was that they spent a couple of days in Scotland going up and down a few mountains, you know. So, so they were they were hardly trained in in mountain warfare. Um, but they, you know, I think one of the strengths we have is Canada was still uh, very much a rural nation at that time. So a lot of these guys, they grew up in the country. They grew up hunting and fishing and, and out in the woods and, and that. And so, yeah, they sort of knew how to improvise and, and uh, do things, uh, you know, that need to be done. And you can see by the look of this guy, you know, um, there's not a lot of not a lot of fat on these guys. <laughs> you know, they, they, they leaned down very quickly and, um, and they were good. Uh, they they learned because um, you you made the point it's an infantry men's battle. Um, I think Operation Husky, the whole fighting in Sicily, it almost becomes a, a platoon battle. Yeah, you see again, it's it's one platoon operating all by itself. Uh, you know, with a ridge between it and the other platoon on the other side, and and so you know we see here with the fight for Azure, you can see it's like ppcli a that's a company of the ppcli b companies over on the other side um they're operating largely almost independent of each other and so then it becomes very much a company commander directed battle often a platoon commander's projected battle so you have lieutenants, captains, majors at the highest rank, um, who are having to figure out what I, what it is I'm doing. I've been told by the, my, my big battalion commander, I've got to take uh, Cantonera, but how do I do that? <laughs> you know? I mean, I was um, looking at that, that when you sent me that map, I was actually looking at those locations on Google Earth a few days ago and looking at the spaces, you know, and you know, I'm from Normandy, as everyone knows, where, you know, often you kind of get the two up, two behind with companies and you can have kind of a, a quite broad front for advance. I think with these conditions here, as you said there, it's you can't use a battalion as a battalion. You have to use it as companies. And, you, and it's almost you know, following kind of goat trails where it's like mm -hmm. one guy at the front and the rest of the company might be spread back almost down a single file hundreds of yards behind you. So in this situation, individual skills of platoon commanders and sergeants are, 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 are vital for mm -hmm. the progression. Yeah, and you have the, um, the, uh, the pioneers, the uh, scouts um, become very important. And this is a message, a message that the Canadians will take away from them when they go to in the rest of the Italian campaign is uh, real, you know, making sure you have a very strong scout platoon, making sure you have a really strong sniper, sniper contingent, um, because it's going to fall to a lot of individual soldiers to carry the day. Um, and, and they really realize that and they really learn that in this map where they're moving towards this era. Because, um, as you say, you know, that's a that's a a really tumbled 
piece of landscape there. It's it's a, it's just a jumble of little mountains and ridges and gullies and everything. And and they're figuring this through. And most of those arrows, again, they're actually moving at night. Mm -hmm. um, so they're they're doing a lot of that is is move forward at night. Um, if you're lucky, you hit the Germans right at dawn. Uh, and you just come right at them head on uh, at close quarters. And, and that's how they win a lot of these scraps. And uh, it's, it, and it's costly, you know, um, this, this four days of battle is, is one of the most costly that we uh, face. Yeah. And that, you know, these folk, these are patrols in, uh, in Agera there, which are, are great photos. And we've got Melissa Wing on tomorrow, who's talking about the fact that she's on Twitter today that, that for Husky, I think she said the Canadian Photographic Unit and the Canadian Film Unit combined as one. And, and the press coverage seem, she, she maintains is better from Husky compared to, uh, to early campaigns, which she'll talk about at length tomorrow. But mm -hmm. we are lucky we've got some amazing images. I mean, they, they do convey a lot, don't they? They convey the... The, the, the canalization of the streets they can raid the, the terrain i think even the heat comes across in those photos doesn't it yes i think so yeah and and you know um it was the canadians who had the biggest public relations uh success of the sicilian campaign which was when the seaforth highlanders uh band played in the uh in the central square in Najira here um and the radio cbc radio uh, correspondent uh, Peter Sturzberg was able to record that performance. It was also filmed, but the, the most important part is, is the actual recording. That one? Yeah, that's this one. Um, and so Peter Sturzberg records it um, on July 30th. Um, and he then spirits the little record <laughs> that recordings were on in those days uh, to London and it becomes the first broadcast of um, Allied victory within Fortress Europe and a, a huge propaganda uh, of victory for uh, the wow. Canadians who pulled that off. Um, so, um, and in Operation Husky 2013, when I was there, the Seaforth Highlanders pipe band returned and in the same square on the same day at exactly the same hour, they performed the all the same tunes um, in How front fantastic of is that? Yeah, which was, was, was very cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's a, very so memorable. We'll bring up another map because kind of the campaign is winding down now because we, we know mm -hmm. this, the whole point of this show is an overview and they're going to do a deeper <laughs> dive with Brad and use those examples of... of, of 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 those two battles to kind of really get to grips with it, but but take us through the last the last few days mm -hmm. and you know and and uh, you know one of the things that we we often talk about is is that you know thirty eight days to take Sicily is was you know was pretty damn good, but if you're an infantryman fighting all the way through, you're going to be absolutely shattered after about two weeks. Mm -hmm. So what what is happening to the Canadian Army in terms of manpower and in terms of motivation when you get to kind of the end of July? The big problem that they're facing here is July 31st, they move out of Ajira and through Regobudo and into what's called the Salsa River Valley. They can't go down the highway because the Germans have it too, too heavily defended and they realize that, you know, it doesn't make sense to fight one roadblock after another after another until you finally get to Adrano, which is on the, uh, it's the at the bottom of Mount Etna. Um, so they go into the Salsa Valley, and it's mostly 2nd Brigade that's doing this. Um, the other two brigades are, are, as you say, they're pretty much shot. They've, they've fought, and they've fought, and they, are, they need a rest. So does 2nd Brigade, but you know, somebody's got to carry it forward. Um, and so they go in there, and again, it's, it's such rugged ground, they can't, no transport can accompany them. So they actually are using mules um, as they're conveying their supplies. But they're having to fight these little battles up on the, to Hill 736, uh, Monte Revoluto, and those different positions. And those attacks are not being made by entire companies even. 
or battalions, I mean. Um, the attack on Hill 736, it says Loyal Edmonton, but it's actually just two platoons. Um, and they only number about 50 men in total who go up that hill. And one of them is a lieutenant called Johnny John Dugan, who I got to know very well. And the other platoon commander was his best friend, uh, Earl Christie, who is killed in that attack. And Dugan is is actually shot. Um, bullet a bullet hits his Thompson submachine gun, shatters the machine gun. The splinters of the machine gun go into his arms, and another bullet goes into his helmet and it goes around inside the helmet. As often happened with the the Tommy helmets, and grooves a big uh, bloody gash in his head, and then exits and. Dugan with only now uh, supporting his hand with the one broken hand uh, comes over the top of the summit with a revolver and uh, is facing first uh, Fallschirmjäger uh, division machine gun position and the paratroopers who are pretty hard guys take a look at this guy who's got blood flying down his face waving a pistol around and they run um when they could have just cut him down uh, and so that's how these little battles are getting won it's just individual crazy uh courage in the end that uh carries them through to adrano and once they get to adrano the british by this time have broken out through catania and they're moving up the other way and so the canadians are told to basically stand down outside of Drano in order to give room for the British to advance through and on to Messina. And so our campaign really ends on the 7th of August, whereas the campaign continues for, you know, some more days until um, the Straits of Messina are reached. Mm. And so well, that's thank you for that. You've out. got a few more photos you might as well go through while, while we've got you here. So, cause mm -hmm. they are great photos. These, these are medal recipients in the uh, PPCLI, aren't they? Yes. Yeah, they all were decorated for courage and valor. And uh, and I think all of those four survived the war. And you can tell us later on because their uniforms are, are nice and clean. That's 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 not that's not immediately after combat. They're, 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 they look a bit fuller in the face. And uh, um, yeah, you know, it's, um, not, you know, it's a it's a press photo as they all yeah. are. This one yeah, the, as well because communications came up earlier in the sidebar. You know, in those conditions with mountains and and with companies, you you, you know you you're going to have to rely on you know platoon and company radio sets. So how would would you give a kind of a summary of how well uh, Canadian communications were pushing across those mountains? They had a lot of problems with this to the point where um, Royal Regiment uh, Royal Canadian Regiment Commander Ralph Crow. Um, lost all wireless communications with his companies that were out ahead of him. And he takes his headquarters wireless units and they actually were moving forward alone, um, trying to get back into contact because um, the, the broadcast distance is easy to block with, with the terrain and doesn't have that much range. Crow uh, ends up leading his men his, his signalers uh, right into a German ambush, and he himself is killed at that point. Um, and another example of, as Strom Galloway said, is one of the mistakes we were starting to make is, you know, if you lose wireless contact, you don't just grab all your wireless sets and go running forward to see, <laughs> see if you can reestablish contact. That's, that's not a logical thing to do. Um, you would bring up another company and then go forward with that company uh, to try and, and, and make contact. So that's the kind of mistakes we made. And it does lead to problems that, you know, just being able to establish um, connectivity. Um, even Simmons has trouble sometimes getting wireless communication to his brigade commanders, you know, it gets blocked at times. Um, so there's, there's problems with this. Yeah, and you, this is a really good photo. It shows just, you know, the de the heights of, you know, the Germans up here at the top can be just overlooking those trucks and, and 
you know, there's not any room to maneuver because it's, it's, it falls away on the other side. So we will wind things down, but we, we will definitely have this photo here of, of Monty decorating other soldiers there if you want to explain about that. And I want to ask you some questions about lessons learned, really, about from the campaign. But let's look about this first. Yeah, so <laughs> this is interesting because there's there's disputes about which one this is. It, um, it's generally considered to be a Van Du of the Royal 22nd Regiment, uh, Pierre Pot Van, who's being uh, decorated. But there's also a, a, a school of thought that says it's a First Nations Canadian uh, soldier whose name escapes me right now, who's being decorated. Uh, and so we don't know what the actual true answer is here, but the decoration did happen in Sicily. Um, these shots that where they're all looking a little healthier, a little more cleaned up, were taken in what they called Happy Valley, uh, where they were moved. It's, it's north of Catania, and it was uh, an area of, of fruit trees and grapes and a little, couple of little villages. And they really were given a, a nice time to wind down uh, and kind of recover. You know, they had lost 562 guy, Canadians killed in the course of this campaign. So they had, they, you know, they were all kind of aware of the price they had paid. Hmm. So lessons learned, because you know, Sim Simmons, as you say, goes on to Normandy to command a, a corps, uh, others fight in Italy. Uh, what were the lessons not learned and what were the lessons learned? Because with all these things, it's always sort of two steps forward, one step back in terms of the Allies learning how to win the war. But what what would you say, let's just do the lessons that weren't learned. What What should have think, come out of Sicily that, that perhaps wasn't. I think the lesson that wasn't learned, and Canadians will repeat it again and again and again because of the divisional commanders we have, um, particularly the 1st Canadian Infantry Division, is that when you throw individual battalions thrown to get forward by themselves with only some artillery support, it's going to be very hard for them to win a battle. And, and we see, particularly as we move into Italy, um, Simmons has been replaced by Major General Chris Vokes. We see at Ortona, particularly, uh, his penchant for thinking, I can just throw one battalion against the German lines and they can punch a hole through and then I can throw the rest of the brigade in and exploit that hole. And repeatedly, that strategy fails. Um, and that's, you know, partly they were led into, it's a bit of a trap they fell into because in Sicily, it kind of worked. You know, we were talking about how, you know, we were one battalion and then it might only yeah. be the company at the end. Um, you know, we were seeing how you could take this dagger, if you will, jab it through and then widen that wedge out. Um, and they did that in Sicily quite a bit, but it doesn't work so well in Italy. The, the frontage is broader and the Germans are better able to entrench better. And yet it's a lesson we don't really learn. We just keep repeating it again and again and again um, to a lot of cost. So that's a lesson that should have been learned, wasn't. I think what we did learn was that um, there needed to be um, a much more acceptance and reliance upon the individual initiative of company leaders, platoon commanders, and everybody else to be able to get the job got done. And I think um, that's something that Canadians become very good at uh, as they move up Italy. Um, they become ever more adept at, at that kind of strength and, and learning how to work really well with the tanks, the artillery and the infantry supporting each other. Cause there were, there were problems in Sicily where, the, you know, that wasn't happening. Another thing you said is, you know, leadership, you uh, can't remember the people you talked about, you said, and he got killed later on, he got killed later on. So, you know, the, the, are enough key company commanders coming out of this who can go on forward or do they have to rebuild some of these regiments? No, they tended to be able to just uh, promote 
uh, from within right. and, and go forward, uh, especially now. Um, we see later on in the Italian campaign, especially when you get up by Ortona uh, and the casualties keep mounting, you know, we see what was the, um, the veterans of Sicily, the veterans of the advance up the boot uh, to Ortona and then on to the Melfa River and Leary Valley, on to the Gothic line. You start that core leadership group is starting to disappear. And with it, you start seeing the um, that morale that exists from the reserve units, uh, all coming from the same community, all having gone to school together, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That starts to disappear because those so many of those fellows have been killed or wounded or lost to disease. Um, and reinforcements start to come in from all over Canada. So the Seaforth Highlanders, are no longer just from Vancouver. They've got guys from the prairies and, and everything else that's filtered in with them. Um, so there's still the nugget there, but it's it's a smaller nugget. And I think that you see um, a cohesiveness within the battalions that starts to fade as you get further and further into the Italian campaign. Okay, thank you. And you talked earlier about the importance of the can loan program and some of these officers coming who'd served with the British in, in Tunisia. But a question going the other way uh, from Sean Brennan is saying, were some Sicily participants transferred to Canadian army in England to utilize combat experience there? Yes. Uh, that happens a little later. Um, right after the battle of Ortona, we start seeing officers being um, sent to uh, UK uh, integrated into the um, units that will be involved in the invasion of Normandy. <laughs> and it happens at various levels. Um, there's tankers that are put into the uh, tank regiments. Um, there's infantry, of course, filtered in. There's even a couple battalion commanders who are brought back and given a good battalion command. Um, so, yes, they're definitely trying to bring that uh, combat experience into the fold there. And uh, so it does It does make a difference. Okay, thank you. And people are talking about, well, Brad is talking about the um, the breaking up of the uh, the old regional system. And the same thing is happening in the British Army as well, you know, that in like it did in the First World War is the, 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 war, the Second World War, like the power battalions, you know, are, are being broken up, replacements are coming through. We always make that point in Normandy that just because a unit is in the British Army is theoretically from the Northeast, doesn't mean that all the men within that are from the Northeast, they're from wherever the recruiting pool was bringing them in. Does Sicily kind of provide the high watermark in some ways of the last moment when there are these sort of regional units coming together? And if it is the last point, d d does it really matter? Is that a bit of a false idea we have that because people are from the same place, they fight better because when you look later in the war, there are units doing really well who have no real regional connections. So mm. what's your take on the, on the coming from the same place? Uh, obviously it can help. You said earlier they're from the same mm. street, but does it, does it really make a difference? I think it can make a difference in, in some cases. Um, you know, we see uh, again at Normandy, actually the third, the third infantry division, it still has that that cont continuity when it lands at Juno Beach because again you know they they train together the North Shore New Brunswick Regiment for example that entire group is pretty much all North Shore New Brunswick uh, citizens that that are fighting there so it's it's I think it can be overemphasized um, but it does play a, a major role in the uh, initial um, esprit de corps, if you will. Um, and then it it goes away to a large extent because of casualties and you start to build um, a much more diversified unit. But I think because there's still within the um, reserve units, which are the majority of, of uh, the Canadian Army battalions, there's still always that core nugget that I've talked about that then they provide a, a point of strength around which others can organize. Yeah. And uh, so that is, I think, the big uh, advantage that the uh, 
I mean, I'm, I'm with you. I mean, we can all pull out examples from history of, of, of units in different armies who are all from the same place who get completely wiped out in occasions. It doesn't it doesn't guarantee you're going to win a battle. It, it probably it what come what works better is how are you trained? What's what? How are your how is your leadership? Have you been trained to deal with the latest weapons you're going to be uh, meeting on the battlefield? But I think if you get those things right, then having some kind of core local identity gives you an extra boost. It's the same thing where they, they mm-hmm. talk about sports, isn't it? There, there's a good bond within the team. The, 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 it's a happy a happy training dressing room, they say, in football in England. You know, And I think yeah. it can give you an edge. But I think if you haven't got the core ability to actually win a football game or indeed win a battle, just mm-hmm. because you're the same place from the same place is, is not going to guarantee victory, is it? No. And I think, you know, actually, as there's an example of this, is um, second division is throughout World War II, the second division has struggles because they got shot, shot to pieces at Dieppe. And they lost a lot of that core stuff, but they also have still retained that. But they weren't, there was never, there, you see often again and again and again with the second division, there's a lack, almost a lack of confidence that exists through that division in, in that, you know, we maybe won't win this battle. And, and, so then they lose quite a number of battles. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I think it goes to that, you know, the team analogy that you make. If, if you have a team that is having, has, having a bad season, you can then, well, it's just continues to go on bad. You it's, know, it's, the, it's the downward <laughs> spiral or the upward spiral. If, if things aren't going well, things spiral down quite quickly. If they're going well, mm-hmm. they spiral upwards quite quickly. That seems to be my limited understanding of, of how of how units progress in World War Two, but we're going down a rabbit hole of talking about morale and units now. But to sum things up, because we will bring things to an end. I mean, we talked about the fact that Canada is is, is showing interest in Operation Husky. That's the, there's the events right there now. There's the conference that the, the Sullivan's organised out in Catania. Are there any more lessons you think we still should be learning from Husky? Is there more study to be done? We've got James's book. We've got your books. Is, does the campaign need more study? And if it needs more study, which bits should we be studying more? I, I think I'd like to see more of a study, and there have been a couple books on on the um, German side of yeah. the fighting in Sicily. But, you know, both of those books were quite a long time ago, um, based on, you know, pretty limited access to documents and stuff like that. You know, I know German documents are hard to find anyway because the archives burned and, you know, uh, so, but uh, it'd be really, I'd like to see more on, you know, how the Germans were responding to things. We've got our sense of how the, the strategies were developing and, and, and uh, the fighting on the ground, but it's, it's pretty much second hand you know it's pretty much yeah. from a little bit of interviews with german prisoners a little bit of our sense of you know okay we fought and this is what we fought um so that's one we're seeing some uh, more attention to the air war in sicily and i think that's an important one that needs to be you know dug more into uh what was the air support like um for the Canadians, it's very seldom even mentioned in the in the war diaries. Like, you know, were they being supported by um, close range bombing or such? You know, we don't actually see that much evidence of it. But you know, maybe it was there. Yeah, no, definitely. And, and with you on the Germans, I mean, the one question I've had this week is, who have you got coming on talking about the Germans? Well, I, I couldn't find anybody who who added anything new. I've got Julio coming on on Wednesday talking about the Italian involvement in Sicily, but we're also talking about the, the it leading to the, to the downfall of Mussolini, et cetera, et cetera. But it, right. it, it, it is, it is, we all are, we are still looking at this, these wars through the lens of the allies. In most cases, there are people doing more and more work on the, on the Axis side. But as you said, limited limits of archives, limits of people who, who, who can actually do the groundwork, but that, yeah, that's an aspect that will, um, we, we will need, but anyway, I'm reminding we've got Alex Black on on Saturday talking about air power. But Mark, we will bring things then now because it's getting way past my bedtime now. In Normandy, <laughs> thank you everybody for watching. Thank you for the questions, and uh, I'll, I'll invite you back on again in the in the later in the year because we're going to be doing the, uh, the Italian campaign sometime in September, October. So I'll invite you back on to do something there, and, and uh, good luck with Brad on Wednesday, and I'll be watching that one as well. 
and we'll do those that deeper dive there, and that'll be fantastic. So the link to that show on uh, uh, on on this day in game military is in the link description below, folks. So uh, thank you, Mark. Thank you, viewers. I will see you all again tomorrow with Melissa Wing for the story of the correspondence in Husky. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Bye.